Book 3, of Words, Chapter 3, of General Terms, 1. The greatest part of words are general terms, all things that exist being particulars. It may perhaps be thought reasonable that words, which ought to be conformed to things, should be so too comma, I mean in their signification, but yet we find quite the contrary. The far greatest part of words that may call languages are general terms, which has not been the effect of neglect or chance but of reason and necessity. 2. That every particular thing should have a name for itself is impossible. First, it is impossible that every particular thing should have a distinct peculiar name. 4. The signification and use of words depending on that connection which the mind makes between its ideas and the sounds it uses as signs of them. It is necessary, in the application of names to things, that the mind should have distinct ideas of the things and retain also the particular name that belongs to everyone, with its peculiar appropriation to that idea. But it is beyond the power of human capacity to frame and retain distinct ideas of all the particular things we meet with, every bird and beast meant so, every tree and plant that affected the senses, could not find a place in the most capacious understanding. If it be looked on as an instance of a prodigious memory, that some generals have been able to call every soldier in their army by his proper name, we may easily find a reason why men have never attempted to give names to each sheep in their flock, or crow that flies over their heads, much less to call every leaf of plants, or grain of sand that came in their way, by a peculiar name. 3. And would be useless, if it were possible. Secondly, if it were possible, it would yet be useless because it would not serve to the chief end of language. Men would in vain heap up names of particular things, that would not serve them to communicate their thoughts. Men learn names, and use them in talk with others, only that they may be understood, which is then only done when, by use or consent, the sound I make by the organs of speech, excites in another man's mind who hears it. The idea I apply it to in mine, when I speak it. This cannot be done by names applied to particular things whereof I alone having the ideas in my mind, the names of them could not be significant or intelligible to another, who was not acquainted with all those very particular things which had fallen under my notice. 4. A distinct name for every particular thing not fitted for enlargement of knowledge. Thirdly, but yet, granting this also feasible, which I think is not, yet a distinct name for every particular thing would not be of any great use for the improvement of knowledge, which, though founded in particular things, enlarges itself by general views, to which things reduced into sorts, under general names, are properly subservient. These, with the names belonging to them, come within some compass, and do not multiply every moment, beyond what either the mind can contain, or use requires. And therefore, in these, men have for the most part stopped but yet not so as to hinder themselves from distinguishing particular things by appropriated names, where convenience demands it, and therefore in their own species, which they have most to do with, and wherein they have often occasion to mention particular persons, they make use of proper names, and their distinct individuals have distinct denominations. 5. What things have proper names, and why? Besides persons, countries also, cities, rivers, mountains and other the like distinctions of place have usually found peculiar names, and that for the same reason, they being such as men have often as occasion to mark particularly, and, as it were, set before others in their discourses with them, and I doubt not but, if we had reason to mention particular horses as often as as have reason to mention particular men, we should have proper names for the one, as familiar as for the other and Bucephalus would be a word as much in use as Alexander. And therefore we see that, amongst jockeys, horses have their proper names to be known and distinguished by, as commonly as their servants, because, amongst them, there is often occasion to mention this or that particular horse when he is out of sight. 6. How general words are made. The next thing to be considered is comma how general words come to be made. 4. Since all things that exist are only particulars. How come we by general terms, or where find we those general natures they are supposed to stand for? Words become general by being made the signs of general ideas, and ideas become general, by separating from them the circumstances of time and place, 
and any other ideas that may determine them to this or that particular existence. By this way of abstraction they are made capable of representing more individuals than one, each of which having in it a conformity to that abstract idea, is, as we call it, of that sort. 7. Shown by the way we enlarge our complex ideas from infancy. But, to deduce this a little more distinctly, it will not perhaps be amiss to trace our notions and names from their beginning, and observe by what degrees we proceed, and by what steps we enlarge our ideas from our first infancy. There is nothing more evident, than that the ideas of the person's children converse with, to instance in them alone, are, like the persons themselves, only particular. The ideas of the nurse and the mother are well framed in their minds, and, like pictures of them there, represent only those individuals, the names they first gave to them are confined to these individuals, and the names of nurse and mama, the child uses, determine themselves to those persons. Afterwards, when time and a larger acquaintance have made them observe that there are a great many other things in the world, that in some common agreements of shape, and several other qualities, resemble their father and mother, and those persons they have been used to, they frame an idea which they find those many particulars do partake in, and to that they give, with others, the name man, for example, and thus they come to have a general name, and a general idea, wherein they make nothing new, but only leave out of the complex idea they had of Peter and James, Mary and Jane, that which is peculiar to each, and retain only what is common to them all. 8. And further enlarge our complex ideas by still leaving out properties contained in them. By the same way that they come by the general name and idea of man, they easily advance to more general names and notions. 4. Observing that several things that differ from their idea of man, and cannot therefore be comprehended out under that name, have yet certain qualities wherein they agree with man, by retaining only those qualities, and uniting them into one idea, they have again another and more general idea to which having given a name they make a term of a more comprehensive extension, which new idea is made, not by any new addition, but only as before, by leaving out the shape, and some other properties signified by the name man, and retaining only a body, with life, sense, and spontaneous motion, comprehended under the name animal. 9. General natures are nothing but abstract and partial ideas of more complex ones. That this is the way whereby men first form general ideas, and general names to them, I think is so evident, that there needs no other proof of it but the considering of the man's self, or others, and the ordinary proceedings of their minds in knowledge. And he that thinks general natures or notions are anything else but such abstract and partial ideas of more complex ones, taken at first from particular existences, will, I fear, be at a loss where to find them. For let any one effect, and then tell me, wherein does his idea of man differ from that of Peter and Paul, or his idea of horse from that of Bucephalus? but in the leaving out something that is peculiar to each individual, and retaining so much of those particular complex ideas of several particular existences as they are found to agree in, of the complex ideas signified by the names man and horse, leaving out but those particulars wherein they differ, and retaining only those wherein they agree, and of those making a new distinct complex idea, and giving the name animal to it, one has a more general term that comprehends with man several other creatures. Leave out of the idea of animal, sense and spontaneous motion, and the remaining complex idea, made up of the remaining simple ones of body, life, and nourishment, becomes a more general one, under the more comprehensive term, vivens. And, not to dwell longer upon this particular, so evident in itself, by the same way the mind proceeds to body, substance, and at last to being, thing and such universal terms, which stand for any of our ideas whatsoever. To conclude, this whole mystery of genera and species, which make such a noise in the schools, and are with justice so little regarded out of them, is nothing else but abstract ideas, more or less comprehensive, with names annexed to them, in all which this is constant and unvariable, that every more general term stands for such an idea and is but a part of any of those contained under it. 10. Why the genus is ordinarily made use of in definitions. This may show us the reason why, in the defining of words, 
which is nothing but declaring their signification, we make use of the genus, or next general word that comprehends it, which is not out of necessity, but only to save the labor of enumerating the several simple ideas which the next general word or genus stands for, or, perhaps, sometimes the shame of not being able to do it. But though defining by genus and differentia, I crave leave to use these terms of art, though originally Latin, since they most probably suit those notions they are applied to, I say, though defining by the genus be the shortest way, yet I think it may be doubted whether it be the best. This I am sure, it is not the only, and so not absolutely necessary. For, definition being nothing but making another understand by words what idea the term defined stands for, a definition is best made by enumerating those simple ideas that are combined in the signification of the term defined, and if, instead of such an enumeration, men have accustomed themselves to use the next general term, it has not been out of necessity, or for greater clearness, but for quickness and dispatch sake. For I think that, to one who desired to know what idea the word man stood for, if it should be said, that man was a solid extended substance, having life, sense, spontaneous motion, and the faculty of reasoning, I doubt not but the meaning of the term man would be as well understood, and the idea it stands for be at least as clearly made known, as when it is defined to be a rational animal, which, by the several definitions of animal, vivens, and corpus, resolves itself into those enumerated ideas. I have, in explaining the term man, Followed here the ordinary definition of the schools, which, though perhaps not the most, exact, yet serves well enough to my present purpose. And one may, in this instance, see what gave occasion to the rule, that a definition must consist of genus and differentia, and it suffices to show us the little necessity there is of such a rule, or advantage in the strict observing of it. For, definitions, as has been said, being only the explaining of one word by several others, so that the meaning or idea it stands for may be certainly known, languages are not always so made according to the rules of logic, that every term can have its signification exactly and clearly expressed by two others. Experience sufficiently satisfies us to the contrary, or else those who have made this rule have done ill, that they have given us so few definitions conformable to it but of definitions more in the next chapter. 11. General and universal are creatures of the understanding, and belong not to the real existence of things. To return to general words, it is plain, by what has been said, that general and universal belong not to the real existence of things, but to the inventions and creatures of the understanding, made by it for its own use, and concern only signs, whether words or ideas. Words are general, as has been said, when used for signs of general ideas, and so are applicable indifferently to many particular things, and ideas are general when they are set up as the representatives of many particular things, but universality belongs not to things themselves, which are all them particular in their existence, even those words and ideas which in their signification are general. When therefore we quit particulars, the generals that rest are only creatures of our own making their general nature being nothing but the capacity they are put into, by the understanding, of signifying or representing many particulars. For the signification they have is nothing but a relation that, by the mind of man, is added to them. 12. Abstract ideas are the essences of genera and species. The next thing therefore to be considered is, what kind of signification it is that general words have. For as it is evident that they do not signify barely one particular thing, for then they would not be general terms, but proper names, so, on the other side, it is as evident they do not signify a plurality, for man and men would then signify the same, and the distinction of numbers, as the grammarians call them, would be superfluous and useless. That then which general words signify is a sort of things, and each of them does that by being a sign of an abstract idea in the mind, to which idea, as things existing are found to agree, so they come to be ranked under that name, or, which is all one, be of that sort, whereby it is evident that the essences of the sorts, or, if the Latin word pleases better, species of things, are nothing else but these abstract ideas. For the having the essence of any species, 
being that which makes anything to be of that species, and the conformity to the idea to which the name is annexed being that which gives a right to that name, the having the essence, and the having that conformity, must needs be the same thing, since to be of any species, and to have a right to the name of that species, is all one. As, for example, to be a man, or of the species man, and to have right to the name man, is the same thing. Again, to be a man, or of the species man, and have the essence of a man, is the same thing. Now, since nothing can be a man, or have a right to the name man, but what has a conformity to the abstract idea the name man stands for, nor anything be a man, or have a right to the species man, but what has the essence of that species, it follows, that the abstract idea for which the name stands, and the essence of the species, is one and the same. From whence it is easy to observe, that the essences of the sorts of things, and, consequently, the sorting of things, is the workmanship of the understanding that abstracts and makes those general ideas. 13. They are the workmanship of the understanding, but have their foundation in the similitude of things. I would not here be thought to forget, much less to deny, that nature, in the production of things, makes several of them alike. There is nothing more obvious, especially in the races of animals, and all things propagated by seed, but yet I think we may say, the sorting of them under names is the workmanship of the understanding, taking occasion, from the similitude it observes amongst them, to make abstract general ideas, and set them up in the mind, with names annexed to them, as patterns or forms, for, in that sense, the word form has a very proper signification, to which as particular things existing are found to agree, so they come to be of that species, have that denomination, or are put into that classes. For when we say this is a man, that a horse, this justice, that cruelty, this a watch, that a jack, what do we else but rank things under different specific names, as agreeing to those abstract ideas, of which we have made those names the signs. And what are the essences of those species set out and marked by names, but those abstract ideas in the mind, which are, as it were, the bonds between particular things that exist, and the names they are to be ranked under. And when general names have any connection with particular beings, these abstract ideas are the medium that unites them, so that the essences of species, as distinguished and denominated by us, neither are nor can be anything but those precise abstract ideas we have in our minds. And therefore the supposed real essences of substances, if different from our abstract ideas, cannot be the essences of the species we rank things into. For two species may be one, as rationally as two different essences be the essence of one species, and I demand what are the alterations, which, may, or may not be made in a horse or lead, without making either of them to be of another species. In determining the species of things by our abstract ideas, this is easy to resolve. But if any one will regulate himself herein by supposed real essences, he will I suppose, be at a loss, and he will never be able to know when anything precisely ceases to be of the species of a horse or lead. 14. Each distinct abstract idea is a distinct essence. Nor will any one wonder that I say these essences, or abstract ideas, which are the measures of name, and the boundaries of species, are the workmanship of the understanding. Who considers that at least the complex ones are often, in several men, different collections of simple ideas, and therefore that is covetousness to one man, which is not so to another. Nay, even in substances, where their abstract ideas seem to be taken from the things themselves, they are not constantly the same, no, not in that species which is most familiar to us, and with which we have the most intimate acquaintance, it having been more than once doubted whether the fetus born of a woman were a man, even so far as that it hath been debated, whether it were or were not to be nourished and baptized, which could not be, if the abstract idea or essence to which the name man belonged were of nature's making, and were not the uncertain and various collection of simple ideas, which the understanding put together, and then, abstracting it, affixed a name to it, so that, in truth, every distinct abstract idea is a distinct essence and the names that stand for such distinct ideas are the names of things essentially different. Thus a circle is as essentially different from an oval as a sheep from a goat, 
and rain is as essentially different from snow as water from earth, that abstract idea which is the essence of one being impossible to be communicated to the other, and thus any two abstract ideas, that in any part vary one from another, with two distinct names annexed to them, constitute two distinct sorts, or, if you please, species, as essentially different as any two of the most remote or opposite in the world. 15. Several significations of the word essence. But since the essences of things are thought by some, and not without reason, to be wholly unknown, it may not be amiss to consider the several significations of the word essence. Real essences. First, essence may be taken for the very being of anything, whereby it is what it is, and thus the real internal, but generally, in substances, unknown constitution of things, whereon their discoverable qualities depend, may be called their essence. This is the proper original signification of the word, as is evident from the formation of it, essential in its primary notation, signifying properly, being, and in this sense it is still used, when we speak of the essence of particular things, without giving them any name. Nominal essences. Secondly, the learning and disputes of the schools having been much busied about genus and species, the word essence has almost lost its primary signification, and, instead of the real constitution of things, has been almost wholly applied to the artificial constitution of genus and species. It is true, there is ordinarily supposed a real constitution of the sorts of things, and it is past doubt there must be some real constitution on which any collection of simple ideas coexisting must depend. But, it being evident that things are ranked under names into sorts or species, only as they agree to certain abstract ideas, to which we have annexed those names, the essence of each genus, or sort, comes to be nothing but that abstract idea which the general, or sortal, if I may have leave so to call it from sort, as I do general from genus name stands for and this we shall find to be that which the word essence imports in its most familiar use these two sorts of essences i suppose may not unfitly be termed the one the real the other nominal essence 16 constant connection between the name and nominal essence between the nominal essence and the name there is so near a connection that the name of any sort of things cannot be attributed to any particular being but what is this essence whereby it answers that abstract idea whereof that name is the sign. 17. Supposition, that species are distinguished by their real essences useless. Concerning the real essences of corporeal substances, to mention these only, there are, if I mistake not, two opinions. The one is of those who, using the word essence for they know not what, suppose a certain number of those essences, according to which all natural things are made and wherein they do exactly every one of them partake, and so become of this or that species. The other and more rational opinion is of those who look on all that natural things to have a real, but unknown, constitution of their insensible parts, from which flow those sensible qualities which serve us to distinguish them one from another, according as we have occasion to rank them into sorts, under common denominations. The former of these opinions, which supposes these essences as a certain number of forms or moulds, wherein all that natural things that exist are cast, and do equally partake, has, I imagine, very much perplexed the knowledge of natural things. The frequent productions of monsters, in all the species of animals, and of changelings, and other strange issues of human birth, carry with them difficulties, not possible to consist with this hypothesis since it is as impossible that two things partaking exactly of the same real essence should have different properties, as that two figures partaking of the same real essence of a circle should have different properties. But were there no other reason against it, yet the supposition of essences that cannot be known, and the making of them, nevertheless, to be that which distinguishes the species of things, is so wholly useless and unserviceable to any part of our knowledge that that alone were sufficient to make us lay it by, and content ourselves with such essences of the sorts or species of things as come within the reach of our knowledge, which, when seriously considered, will be found, as I have said, to be nothing else but, those abstract complex ideas to which we have annexed distinct general names. 18. Real and nominal essence. Essences being thus distinguished into nominal and real, we may further observe, that, 
In the species of simple ideas and modes, they are always the same, but in substance is always quite different. Thus, a figure including a space between three lines, is the real as well as nominal essence of a triangle, it being not only the abstract idea to which the general name is annexed, but the very center or being of the thing itself, that foundation from which all its properties flow, and to which they are all inseparably annexed. But it is far otherwise concerning that parcel of matter which makes the ring on my finger, wherein these two essences are apparently different. For, it is the real constitution of its insensible parts, on which depend all those properties of color, weight, fusibility, fixedness, etc., which are to be found in it, which constitution we know not, and so, having no particular idea of, having no name that is the sign of it, but yet it is its color, weight, fusibility, fixedness, etc., which makes it to be gold, or gives it a right to that name, which is therefore its nominal essence. Since nothing can be called gold but what has a conformity of qualities to that abstract complex idea to which that name is annexed, but this distinction of essences, belonging particularly to substances, we shall, when he come to consider their names, have an occasion to treat of more fully. 19. Essence is ingenerable and incorruptible. That such abstract ideas, with names to them, as we have been speaking of our essences, may further appear by what we are told concerning essences, viz. that they are all ingenerable and incorruptible, which cannot be true of the real constitutions of things, which begin and perish with them. All things that exist, besides their author, are all liable to change especially those things we are acquainted with, and have ranked into bands under distinct names or ensigns. Thus, that which was grass today is tomorrow the flesh of a sheep, and, within a few days after, becomes part of a man, in all which and the like changes, it is evident their real essence, I. E. That constitution whereon the properties of these several things depended, is destroyed and perishes with them. But essences being taken for ideas established in the mind, with names annexed to them, they are supposed to remain steadily the same, whatever mutations the particular substances are liable to. For, whatever becomes of Alexander and Bucephalus, the ideas to which man and horse are annexed, are supposed nevertheless to remain the same, and so the essences of those species are preserved whole and undestroyed. Whatever changes happen to any or all the individuals of those species, by this means the essence of a species rests safe and entire, without the existence of so much as one individual of that kind. For, were there now no circle existing anywhere in the world, as perhaps that figure exists not anywhere exactly marked out, yet the idea annexed to that name would not cease to be what it is nor cease to be as a pattern to determine which of the particular figures we meet with have or have not a right to the name circle, and so to show which of them, by having that essence, was of that species. And though there neither were nor had been in nature such a beast as an unicorn, or such a fish as a mermaid, yet, supposing those names to stand for complex abstract ideas that contained no inconsistency in them, the essence of a mermaid is as intelligible as that of a man and the idea of an unicorn as certain, steady, and permanent as that of a horse. From what has been said, it is evident, that the doctrine of the immutability of essences proves them to be only abstract ideas, and is founded on the relation established between them and certain sounds as signs of them, and will always be true, as long as the same name can have the same signification. 20. Recapitulation To conclude, this is that which in short I would say, viz that all the great business of genera and species, and their essences, amounts to no more but this colon that men making abstract ideas, and settling them in their minds with names annexed to them, do thereby enable themselves to consider things, and discourse of them, as it were in bundles, for the easier and readier improvement and communication of their knowledge, which would advance but slowly were their words and thoughts confined only to particulars.